it all started with a deal. An unfortunate deal that would unblock the writer's block of Gerald Longley. Gerald was a best-selling author for thriller and horror books, with the occasional sci-fi horror book as well. But he had run into a major problem. Writer's block. Unlike most writer's block that lasted no more than several weeks or more, this block had lasted since the release of his last book, which had been about a year now. Of course, he had money from his previous books, but because of this dry spell, his fans began to dwindle and fewer books were sold. The stress from the pressure to produce another masterpiece had driven him insane, and now he was all alone struggling every day to try to produce, only to fail over and over again. Within the last year, he had lost his wife, and his daughter had started college, so he had no support or encouragement, just the empty space of his huge house and the occasional critter that scuttled along the floor or counter, feeding off the crumbs of food from left-out packages and snack cakes. Gerald awoke slumped over his desk with a face half covered in drool. His left cheek had an indent in it from the pen he had fallen asleep on, and his neck had a crick in it. It had been another overnighter, and Gerald was now trying to adjust his sleepy eyes to the burnt orange light coming through the blinds in the window in front of his desk. There were piles of untidy papers and randomly varying stacks littered around the room and empty bottles of liquor scattered amongst them. He wandered out of his office in his usual boxer briefs, house coat, wife beater, and white tube socks along with the round spectacles on his face down to the kitchen, where he attempted to gather the strength to make breakfast. Of course, when you do nothing but sit in an office and drink while trying to write continuously, you don't get out to the store often. And this was the realization Gerald had come to when he opened the fridge and saw nothing but some random condiments and a leftover pizza from five days ago tucked away in the fridge. Damn it. Of course I would be out of food. I guess I better run to the store. I have to run to Jake's anyway, so I might as well stop at the store while I'm out, he thought to himself as he lazily put on some blue jeans and a white button-up shirt, grabbed his coat and shoes, and headed out the door. He would have probably risked the pizza being heated in the microwave if it meant he didn't have to leave the house. But he was out of liquor too. So Jake's was his go-to when he was running dry. He hopped into his Porsche 911 and drove off to the local supermarket. Back in his younger days, Gerald had a passion for fast cars and that cool aesthetic every guy wants in his car. Over the years, however, along with his success in writing, even this had dwindled too. Now the car was littered with the stains of time, and even sounded weak. The paint was peeling off in multiple places, and he had trash in the back seat and passenger seat of the car. As he was traveling down the highway, he was turning the dial on the radio. Same old songs played day in and day out, along with the stupid advertisements that popped up after every couple of songs. He didn't even know why he bothered. Still, he couldn't bear the silence. He had turned past the country music and that dang hip-hop stuff when he heard an ad that caught his attention. Does your mind feel like a desert? Are you stuck in a loop? Seen more bottles of alcohol than your local brewery? Well then do I have the solution for you. Head on down to 34 Lynch Avenue, just off exit 95. And visit me at Lucky Al's New Leaf, where everyone can turn over a new leaf. Come down today and get your first deal half off. Remember, Lucky Al's New Leaf, 34 Lynch Avenue, just off exit 95. What the hell was that? Gerald thought as a new song came on and started to drain out his speechlessness. There's no way that's real, he said as he chuckled. He dismissed it and proceeded down the highway, all the while subtly thinking about it. He got off the exit and turned for Jake's, but when he rounded the corner, he saw flashing blue and red lights. There were all kinds of people scattered behind some yellow tape that was surrounding the entrance to the store. The building looked like the quenched mouth of a fireplace that had become too hot and had scorched its outer bricks. 
There were puddles of water from the fire trucks who were now leaving the scene as the police officers were surveying the debris. Shocked at the destruction of his once beloved liquor store, Gerald pulled into the parking lot to get out and ask somebody what happened. Ma'am, he said as he gently tapped the shoulder of an elderly onlooker. She turned around and looked at him with polite eyes. Yes, can I help you? She said in a sweet, raspy voice. What happened here? Gerald asked. I was on my morning walk when I saw this young fellow all disheveled running into that store there. Next thing I know, I hear a gunshot followed by a large explosion. The place lit up like a match. Crazy kids. I figured I'd stay around just in case the officers needed me as a witness. Are you a detective? She said, observing his appearance. With his clothing choice, messed up hair, and five o'clock shadow with bags under his eyes, he understood where her assumption had come from, but he responded, No, I'm just a previous customer, that's all. Just curious, as he looked past her at the steaming building. He politely said goodbye and went back to his car. He waited until he was back inside the car, and then all he could say was, Fuck. That had been his favorite liquor store, and the owner was an actual friend of his. Well, the kind of friendship that you can only have with your bartender or local liquor supplier, that is. After he hit the steering wheel a couple of times and cursed some more, he decided to go find another liquor store. Obviously, there were quite a few more liquor stores than just Jake's, but Gerald found comfort in his routines and never liked to change them. Before he pulled out of the parking lot, a small flyer had found its way through the cool morning breeze and ended up smacking right onto his windshield. It startled him at first, but then he noticed what it was. It was a flyer for that Lucky Owl's place he had heard about on the radio. Gerald didn't much believe in God or gods, but he believed there was something out there, and maybe this something was trying to give him a sign. Ah, what the hell, he said as he got out of the car and grabbed the paper. What can it hurt? It's probably some dumb fortune-telling place or something, but I'll check it out. He sat back in his car and headed back up the interstate towards exit 95. He followed the signs until he came upon 34 Lynch Avenue. He made the turn and proceeded down the empty street. All of the buildings out this way were run down and poorly maintained. He was on the outskirts of the city, and so he did not expect much. But when he came upon a small dark blue building with a giant leaf on the front that said, Lucky Owl's New Leaf, he was surprised. This building, apart from all the rest, was clean and pristine. No signs of trash or debris, and not even a single weed was growing through the slick parking lot, which was just big enough to hold about ten cars. Gerald pulled in and parked near the entrance. No other car was there, which seemed odd to Gerald, because the owner of the shop should have had a car too, right? Maybe they have it parked out back, he thought, as he pushed open the glass doors. On the inside, it was clean and slick and had walls that looked like they were freshly painted and floors that were just waxed. There was a single counter spanning the length of the initial room with a single door behind it that led to the rest of the building. On both sides of Gerald, there were about three chairs, obviously for people to sit and wait for their turn. On the top of the counter sat a singular bell and a sign that said, Ring for service. Gerald walked up to the bell and hesitantly gave it a quick tap. A man came strutting out in black dress pants with yellow suspenders holding them up and a dark green shirt covered by a dark blue ducktail coat. He had dark green shoes and a bow tie, along with a large silky midnight blue top hat, with green and yellow silk stripes lined at the base, and a leaf pinned to the front. Welcome, welcome my friend, what brings you in today? The man said behind his bright blue eyes. Gerald opened his mouth to speak when the man spoke again. Wait a minute, let me guess. You heard my ad on the radio, didn't you? Oh, or maybe you got one of my flyers. How did you know that? Gerald said in disbelief. I know everything, my friend. That and how else could you have heard of me? That's the only ads I have currently. <laughs> the strange man said with a deep chuckle. I see. 
So, what is it you sell exactly? Second chances. Second chances. You can't sell that kind of thing. What do you mean? I specialize in deals, my friend. Deals that give the buyer an extra chance at improving their life. So, what do you say? Are you interested? You must be crazy, man. What do you take me for? Some kind of idiot? Of course not, my friend. I only wish to give you a gift. I can prove to you that it works. You'll just have to try it out for yourself. What could it hurt? It could be a waste of money, and Gerald stopped and wondered why he was debating this when he could just leave. You know what? I don't have time for this. I have to get to the store. Nice try, pal. You can scam somebody else, Gerald said as he walked toward the door. Wait, the man said desperately. Let me prove it to you. I'll give you a sample, free of charge. Come on, Gerald. If not for me or yourself, at least do it for Jillian. She wouldn't want to see her father wasting his life away behind some glass bottles. Just try it out. Chills ran through Gerald's body. Who was this guy? How did he know his name? And how did he know his daughter's name? What game are you playing? Who are you? I've already told you, Gerald. I'm your friend. Here, the man said as he placed his palm up on the counter and looked Gerald straight in the eyes. Place your hand on mine and I will show you the benefits of this transaction. Gerald hesitated and then edged slowly towards the man. He placed his hand on top of the man's hand and then he saw his future flash before his eyes. He saw all his future ideas for books and his name in newspapers. He saw himself in front of large crowds and signing countless autographs. He saw his daughter graduating college and congratulating him on his success as they continued to grow a stronger bond. He saw all of these things and more. And then it all ended abruptly as the man took his hand away from Gerald. Being ripped prematurely from an overwhelming bliss, Gerald quickly and frantically grabbed his wallet from his pocket and started shoving money at the man. Please, how much is it? I'll pay anything, please. What is the price? Gerald said in a frantic sputter of words. I do not accept money, my friend. However, there is a price. All I need is a signature on this contract. That, and for you to pick one of these. The man slipped a piece of paper onto the counter and then bent over to pick up three sealed envelopes. He laid the envelopes along with a pen out on the counter for Gerald. Gerald picked up the pen and signed without hesitation. But when it came to choosing an envelope, he paused. What are these? He said out of curiosity. These are your prices. You will choose one of these envelopes and inside will be the price you pay for this gift. And just before Gerald reached one of the envelopes, the man spoke again. Oh, I almost forgot. I mentioned a half-off price in my radio ad, didn't I? Silly me. Here, let me fix that. And as he said this, he waved his hands and made the envelopes shrink to half their original size. Now the prices won't be as bad. Hope you appreciate this coupon. I don't give it out often. Gerald grabbed the envelope on the far left and proceeded to try and open it. nuh -uh said the man as he waved his finger back and forth. You must wait until you have returned home before you can open this. Gerald didn't argue and instead turned away from the strange man and left his store. He had made it home quicker than he ever did. He even forgot to pick up groceries and his beloved liquor as well. He rushed inside and sat at his desk where he opened the small envelope. Inside the envelope was an even smaller letter with fancy handwriting that read, Congratulations! You have received a second chance. You shall now have that which benefits you most. But in return, you must pay a price. The price you have chosen today is the snail of death. This snail will follow you while you're alive. It moves as fast as any normal snail. But if it touches you, then you shall die. As long as you avoid the snail, it will not kill you and will only slowly follow you, but it never stops. It cannot be killed by any means and cannot be blocked by or contained by any means. Now, enjoy your gift. P.S. Oh, I forgot to mention, no returns or refunds. 
What kind of price is this? A snail? Of death? Gerald said as he laid the envelope and letter down confused. That's when it hit him. All the inspiration and creativity he would ever need came flowing into his mind like a river flooding a dam. He could now see endless ideas for writing his books. And so, he started production immediately. He worked into the night and completely forgot about the strange man and his even stranger price envelope before he passed out from exhaustion, this time in his bed and sober. Gerald awoke the next day without a hangover for the first time in over a year. His mind immediately started to race, and so he kept working on his book. He even forgot to eat breakfast again, which proved to be too strong to ignore once he noticed the pain in his stomach from not eating in the last 24 hours. He decided that he would quickly find something to eat and then get right back to work. He went down to his kitchen and looked in the fridge. Damn it, he said as he remembered that he had nothing in his fridge to eat. That's when he remembered the can of corn he had in the cabinet above the sink. As he reached to grab it, he noticed something small and black moving slowly on the back of the can. He turned it around slowly while trying to avoid touching whatever bug was on it. And that's when he saw it. A horribly black and slimy snail edging along ever so slowly to his fingers. In fear, his fingers pushed the can to the side and out of the cabinet, where it broke open on the floor, corn spilling slowly from it. Gerald sighed because he thought it had been smashed by the can. But after a moment of checking, he saw the black snail slowly moving out from the underside of the can and toward Gerald's feet. Gerald eventually learned that it wouldn't stop and that, even though it was very slow and easily avoidable, it seemed to pop up out of nowhere, randomly, and just inch toward Gerald no matter where he was. At the store, in the bathroom, writing his book, in the car, and even while he was trying to sleep, which he didn't do much of afterward. Gerald had tried to go back to the weird store and back to the strange man to tell him he didn't want it anymore. But when he went back the next day, the store was completely gone, like it never existed in the first place. He also learned that nobody else could see the snail but him. He found this out when he became spooked on live TV during an interview about his book, Deal of the Devil, when he saw the snail on the table next to him and left the interview. People started to notice his delirium, and even his own daughter, whom he had grown closer to, even started to see his paranoia. He tried not to mention the snail, but sometimes he let it slip and people randomly hear him talk about his apparent death snail and thought him mad. One day, his daughter became so distraught at seeing him live like this that she signed whatever documentation she had to and had him sent to a facility meant for mentally unstable people. Gerald begged her not to, but she insisted that he needed help and through a number of tests, it had been approved. He died in that facility. One of the doctors thought it would help if he were locked up in a safe room for a few hours to show him that this snail did not exist. What happened next? The doctors chalked up to a heart attack out of fear, but all he could scream with his dying breath was the word, snail, or at least that's what the reports say. Jillian didn't believe a word of the absurd stories being reported. She attended her dad's funeral later that week. She still visits his grave from time to time, and sometimes, sometimes she swears she can spot a snail slowly crawling along the stone, ominous and black.